Today we're talking about these things here. Those things are going to make us lots of money. Right there are the, the, the red wrigglers. The reason that the red wrigglers is they are the most versatile form of worm we can find. They're the most utilized throughout the world. There are various other types, but we find the red wriggler the best. Okay? The invertebrates have got no backbone. Okay? Do we, are we up with that? Red wriggler is a hermaphrodite. Okay? It's a man and a woman together. Okay, so they've got both, both parts together. Two worms need or require to fertilize a cocoon. So what happens is the two worms will mate and they will both lay a cocoon. Now I'll, I'll describe a cocoon to you just now. It takes about 15 days for them to lay the cocoon. So from mating, it's about 15 days, and then they will lay the cocoon. Now this is very important because what we're doing here is we're farming worms to get them to multiply. And we've got to know at what rate they multiply, at what rate they can increase. The cocoon takes about 15 days to hatch. So they lay a cocoon, 15 days later it hatches. Now you're asking yourselves, what's a cocoon? I'll tell you now. The full cycle from mating to maturity is about 60 days. Two months. That's what it takes. Okay? Each worm will lay a cocoon every week. Each worm will lay one cocoon every single week. That's important to know. The population is between 60 and 99 times in 12 weeks. So you take one worm, one worm, that worm will increase 60 times, it will have 60 in Ghanis, between 60 and 99 in Ghanis in 12 weeks. Okay, one. It takes two to mate, so each one will lay a cocoon. So each one will increase between 60 and 99 times in 12 weeks. So what you'll understand now is that the the in increase in population is very, very quick, if it's done correctly. All right. This happens in summer when it's warmer. That's when they produce their best. That's just how it is. That's nature. Lower worm activity does occur in winter depending on the temperature. Now, we'll handle that just now, okay? Just bear that in mind. That's important to know. What is a cocoon? That's a cocoon there. In the cocoon is between 3 and 15 eggs. Okay, so think of a cocoon as an egg basket. You put 3 to 15 eggs in there. That's your cocoon. It protects the eggs. That cocoon will hatch between 3 and 15 babies. Okay, so your, your increase is huge. There's, that's what a cocoon looks like. And we'll go and look for cocoons later on. And when you see cocoons, you get very happy. A red wriggler lives between three and five years. It's not two weeks. It's not ten days. It's between three and five years if it's handled correctly. And they don't die. They don't die easily. I've included a diagram of the life cycle as well as their mating process. Okay, there are two... Two worms, they're mating. For some reason or other, they do it the wrong way. Not like us. <laughs> Feet first, I don't know. I don't know how it works, but that's what they do. Okay? I don't want to know, but that's, that's just the, what happens. <laughs> okay? So you understand that. Okay, how do worm castings affect my plant? Now, this is where things get very, very exciting. I've done a lot of trials with Sidora. Now, Sidora, the Agricultural Institute, they've done trials on my behalf. There's a chap there, Rob Osborne, who's a scientist, and he's very, very pro-vermicast. Why? Because it works. And I'll show you why. Show you how it works. The results have been very encouraging and very conclusive. All the results have shown a minimum uh, top growth improvement of 20%. 
Now, I'm going to show you what that means to you because it puts money in your pocket. Yeah, bargain. That's what we're talking about. Right, because they have bigger leaves, what happens? They get bigger leaves mean bigger roots. Okay? So you've got a bigger leaf, you get a bigger root. Roots where it grows. Bigger roots mean a bigger crop. Bigger crop means more money. That's why we're doing it. Why are we doing worms? We're doing worms to make money. If we're selling vermicost, worm castings, whatever you want to call it, what are we doing? It's to make more money. Okay. Now, you think I'm talking nonsense. Let, let me show you what happened. This is just one example of Swiss chart that we did a trial on. Sidara did a trial. Not me. Sidara did, did the trial. I was there. I gave them the product. And I watched the method, methodology. So vermicast inclusion in the, in the soil mix, in the, in the potting mix. We put it at 10%, 30%, 20%, and there's the control. And what happened was we got an increase over the control of 29.55% at 20%. 20% inclusion. So in other words, if this is my, my pot, I put 20% vermicost in here. That's all I put in, 20%. 90 pair, love. Okay? 20%. What 20% does, it increases the size of my, of my crop. How does it do it? Okay, we'll get to that just now. Remember, people, 20%. Don't forget that. Why? Do I say that? 20% inclusion gave us 20% improvement in growth. 20% inclusion gave us 20% better growth. So 20% is, is the figure. Don't forget that. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to go through the money side of things. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this to make money. Economic impact is the type of crop and the type of farming. You get your intensive farming and you get your extensive farming. Intensive is when you're planting in pots and it's undercover or in a room or whatever, that's intensive. It's like the cannabis boys grow it intensively. They grow cannabis indoors because they want a bigger crop. If they do it outdoors, they don't get as big a crop, but it's far cheaper. So they're two distinct methods. Profitability is determined by intensive farming, extensive farming, and plant density. That's how many plants do I put in a hectare. Okay. Right. The inclusion rate, as I just said, is between 10 and 20% of vermicost in the soil. Vermicost in the soil. How do I know it's 20%? Because I've done it. Okay. There we put in 30% and our results weren't as good. And I'll tell you why that is. Because worm castings or vermicasts have water retention capabilities. They hold water. Okay. So if I take this and I put in 30% and I add water, it's going to retain the moisture. It's going to keep the water in. And that's going to drown the plant. That's going to stunt its growth. And the higher the percentage of vermicast increase you get, the more problems you have. We tried at 50%, and guess what? Or Shonila. And I'll tell you how I know. Okay. I, my first bag of vermicost, I was very chuffed, happy. I went to go and see a friend of mine in Wienan. And his wife had four pots on her veranda. Nice pots. She had some fancy trees. I don't know, one tree from the next. Fancy shrubs. And I said to him, Louis, use this. This is magic stuff. So she took a 40 kg bag and she put it, emptied it in each, in each pot. So she put 10 kgs in there. Ah, a month later I went to go and see you. I said, hey, how's it going? He said, hey, you've got to come and look, see what's happening. Now I went to have a look and the, these fancy trees were dying. 
They were dying. I took a photograph, I sent it to my mate, I said, I said, Rob, help me, what's happening? He said, they're drowning. Okay, and I said, why are they drowning? He said, I don't know, but let's have a look, see. We did a test, and the, the, water, the water retention of vermicost is very, very high. So what happened was, when you watered those pots, they were drowning, they were keeping the water. So your question is 20%, 20% is what we call the optimum, that's the best. If you go a little bit higher or a little bit lower, it doesn't matter. But don't go too high. Don't go too high. Because A, it's not economical, and B, you're going to have a problem with, with drowning. Okay, are we all happy with that? Okay, I've done all this stuff, so I know. That's what I'm telling you. Right, we're going to do a calculation. We're going to take cabbages. You saw all these cabbages out here. Okay, a population rate of 30,000 cabbages per hectare. That's more or less what people plant. Okay? Are we happy? What are we all going to use vermicost for? Cabbages, butternut, whatever. Okay. The average rate of a cabbage is 2,5 kgs. Okay? So here I've taken 30,000 multiplied by 2,5 is 75,000 kgs per hectare. That's what will grow. That's what I will reap off there. Therefore, the mass and the income is 3 rand 06 per kilogram. That was taken off the Joburg market, I think it was last week. So that's what they pay. That's what you will get on the market, the 3 rand 06 per kilogram. Okay? Therefore, your income, okay, your expenses are very high. But your income is 229,500 per hectare. Because you take 75,000 kgs there and you multiply it by 3 or 6. Okay. So that is your income per hectare. Now we take 20% improvement in yield. And how can I say that? I can say that because of that. Okay. I proved it to myself. I don't say things if I haven't seen it myself. Okay. This, this trial was quite incredible because we did it here at Top Crop, which is down the road, and was only put in there what we call their growing medium, and we got 20% better growth on wet mass and dry mass. So what that means is we harvested the top of the plants, was 20% better growth average across the, the thing. They were then taken to Sedora and dried, Oven dried for two weeks, and it was still 20% improvement. Okay, so that's how we know it's 20% improvement. And what is, okay, what is the improvement? Let's just, what is the improvement? The improvement is in leaf size. Bigger leaves, not more leaves, bigger leaves. Okay, that's important to understand. Because bigger leaves are, leaves are like the solar panels for plants. They take in nutrients, at they, they, and then they, the, the roots grow bigger. They photosynthesize better. The photosynthesize gives it more energy, gives it more vuma than the plant can grow. Okay, so that's what this is all about. All right, so now we've got to a point where we're saying 20% improvement in yield mass. That means at an average of 45,000 rand per hectare more. Okay? And bear in mind, we're only putting in 20% of the root zone. Okay? So in other words, if you take a 2.5 kg um, cabbage, the assumption is that the roots are the same size. So any tree that grows, the roots are the same. Any plant that grows, the roots are the same. So if it's 2.5 kgs above ground, it'll be 2.5 kgs below ground. Okay, so we put, we apply the vermicost according to that formula. We want 20% of the root zone, which works out to, I'll show you now. Okay, so we want to put 15 cubes per hectare. 15 cubic meters per hectare of vermicost. Because we've got we're putting in 20% in the root zone. So 20% is 15 cubes. Okay. 
per cube, the prices vary for, for vermicost. It varies between, yeah. So that will cost us 12,000 rand per hectare to put in 15 cubes. Sorry, that should be 18,000 rand per hectare. So we take the 45,900 rand additional income because we are 20% more crop, okay? Minus the 18,000 will give us an improvement of 27,900 additional income, additional income. That gives us 12.5%, 12.15% improvement in total. Okay, now that calculation is just to show you how it works, okay, that it does work. Now we're going to discuss why does it work. We don't know why it works. Why do you think that works? Come people, why do you think that works? I'll tell you. Okay, application rate in field will be between 10 and 25 cubes of vermicost per hectare, okay, which will give you an increase in, in income. Why does worm castings work? Okay, in this section we're going to discuss the value and the properties of worm castings, vermicost, whatever you want to call it, okay. Do worm castings improve my soil? Number one. And the answer is yes, it does. Worm castings also, they can adjust the pH in your soil. They stabilize the pH in your soil. pH is very important for anybody that's doing a crop. pH is vital. The two acid, a low pH is too acid, a high pH is too alkaline. Plants don't grow in that. Okay. Worm castings contain, this is where it comes, they contain bacteria, fungi, algae, nematodes, protozoa, and viral components. What are those things? Those things are bugs. Those things are bugs. Why are we sitting here with masks on? Because of bugs. It's the same thing. It's a bug. But they're good bugs and they're bad bugs. Okay, we're talking about good bugs. Why are we talking about good bugs? Good bugs are aerobic. They breathe like we do. Those are good bugs. Bad bugs, they don't want air. If you go to the dump, it smells. Why does it smell? Those are anaerobic bugs in there. They're bad bugs. They smell. They're not nice. Okay. Vermicost is no odor, no nothing. It's aerobic. It's air. It likes air. Those are the good boys. Okay, type of microorganisms or bugs. Okay, we have viruses, we have protozoa, we have bacteria, algae, and fungi. I don't know if you've heard about those things, but that's why this stuff works. Right, bacteria. There's a bacteria there in the corner. That's what a bacteria looks like. There are thousands and millions of types of bacteria, but that's what it looks like. Okay. What they do is they unlock the nutrients in the soil for the plant. So what happens is there's a lot of stuff in the plant, in, in the soil, that's not available to the plant. It's like if you drive past KFC and they, they, the ovens aren't working, they can't cook. They've got lots of food in there, but you don't want that raw chicken. You want it cooked. Okay. So think of it as there's lots of raw chicken in the, in the thing. The ovens aren't working. What do bacteria do? They make it available. They cook it for the plant so the plant can eat it. Okay, that's what happens. It's a, it's, it's a very simple way of putting it, but that's what happens. The bacteria help complete the nitrogen cycle. I'll come to that now. now. Don't worry about it. I'll describe it. And then these bacteria break down harmful pesticides and pollutants. So if I'm putting stuff in the soil that's not lacquer, the, bacteria, the good bacteria will break it down. They'll make it, will take away the, the, the danger. Okay. So it's like corona. We're looking for something to take away corona. Okay. We don't know what to do at this stage. We're all sitting with masks and social distancing and all that sort of stuff because we don't know how to sort it out. Nature does it in the soil itself. Okay? 
The bacteria slow or stop pathogen. A pathogen is a disease. It's a, it's a sickness. A pathogen is a sickness. So they slow that down. There are four groups of soil bacteria. There's nitrogen cycle, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and whatever that name is. I don't know what that is. Okay. I can't describe it. Okay. Denitrification bacteria that turn nitrogen oxides back into nitrogen gas or nitrous oxide. What they do is they take nitrogen. What are we breathing? Okay. Between, the figures go between 75 and 86% of the available nitrogen is in the air. It's in the air. Okay, it's not in the soil. So the nitrogen cycle influences how the nitrogen from the air is taken and put into the soil, and from the soil it goes into the plant. Okay. There's a, there's a, a diagram of nitrogen cycle. Now you must understand this is how it works for me. This is how I understand it. If you see a cow grazing, What's that cow grazing? It's eating grass. Okay? Can we eat grass? Nah, I don't like salad, so I don't eat grass. Okay? What happens to that cow? That cow eats the grass, and out comes milk. We can drink milk. Okay? That cow eats grass, and it produces meat. We can eat meat. It's the same as a nitrogen cycle. It's taken what's in the air that's not available to the plant, and it's making it into something that the plant can take in. That's what it does. It's like chickens. Chickens eat grain. We can eat grain, but we don't like it too much. What comes out? An egg. We like eggs. We can eat eggs. That's what a nitrogen cycle does. It converts something that's not available into something that's available to the plant. That's why we're getting bigger leaves. That's why everything is growing better. Because what's in the soil now is becoming available to the plant. Are we happy with that? Okay. Protozoa. Protozoa are tiny forms of life. There's protozoa there. That feed on bacteria, fungi, organic matter, and even other protozoa. So protozoa also eat themselves, but they eat other things as well. Protozoa are funny little things. You won't even know them. I mean... But that's what they do. Amoeba are small and often found in feeding bacteria near a plant roots. So what happens is the protozoa will feed on the bacteria and that will all become available to the plant. It's all a, a magic cycle. It's all nature. It's all what nature does. And this is in vermicast. Worm castings, whatever you want to call it. This is what it does. Okay, I'm going to, fungi, it has, there's a fungi there, fungus is like the mushrooms that we eat. That's a fungus. There's fungus in the soil. That also has, it also has its, 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 its place in the soil, and fungi are long threads or strands. Fungi help water retention. Remember I said it retains water? It retains water because it's got lots of fungi. Okay, so that's, it retains moisture, which is a good thing. Fungi decompose organic matter. So if you've got leaves or whatever in the soil, the fungi will attach onto it and it'll decompose it. It'll break it down. Some fungi seek out types of nutrients and phosphates and bring them to the plant with supply. Okay, so what fungi do as well is they bring the nutrients to the plant. You get fungi that grow on the roots. The reason they grow on the roots is they make it available to the plants. Are we with? Okay. We'll get into the exciting stuff just now. They can protect, also protect plants from root feeding organisms and negative fungal diseases. The negative fungal diseases are the anaerobic ones, the bad boys. So you get your good bugs and your bad bugs. The good bugs can conquer the bad bugs if the balance is right in the soil. Okay. 
nematodes. Nematodes look like that. They look like little worms. What do they do? Bacteria and algae and fungi are static in the soil. What these boys do is they catch a ride like a taxi. So they take the stuff throughout the soil. They take the bacteria, they take the fungi, they take the algae throughout the soil. That's what nematodes do. They're good nematodes, and there have been some very bad nematodes as well. Okay? And, and what happens in potatoes? Nematodes eat, eat the tuber. Those are bad nematodes. Okay. These nematodes, however, they will eat the bad nematodes. They chow down on the bad nematodes. That's what they do. That is why they are there. Okay. So everything works in a balance. The whole thing works in a balance. Algae helps water retention and reduces leaching. Algae aids with photosynthesis and carbon and poor carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You know the ozone layer? We plants pull in carbon dioxide out of the uh, out of the, the atmosphere. That's what the algae do. And they also bind the soil and make a better soil structure. Okay. Right. That's heavy stuff. Okay, but that's the basis of what vermicost is all about. It's all about bugs. Don't worry about all the but different. It's all about bugs. Worm casting is not a fertilizer. Why are we getting better growth? It's not because it's a fertilizer. Okay, it's what I call a soil enhancer. Mine is about algae. Where do we find algae? All over. Water, soil, anywhere. But you said then it absorbs and uh, what it absorbs and migrates from the atmosphere. Yes, correct. You've got algae outside here. If you look, uh, look out there. Okay, okay. What is that algae doing? What is that algae doing? Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Algae is there in the dam. Okay. What algae does is it forms. A feed for fish, you get your algae eaters, and it also takes in nitrogen from the air yes, yes. into the dam. How, if, 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 if it's in water, how does it take nitrogen from the air? That's my question. Oskin Kulu Kulu, don't ask me. Ah, <laughs> 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 well, you can ask him. No, it's. it's <laughs> okay, what happens is. It takes nitrogen and it converts it into what they call nitrates. Okay, now nitrate is a different chemical formula to nitrogen. You have nitrates and you have ammonia that are available for plants. Okay, so you have your N, which is floating around. It comes into contact with algae. Algae then makes it into an, what we call a nitrate. It adds oxygen to it. Okay? And then... It's available to the plant. But can't just take in nitrogen on its own. It's got to attach itself to something else. It attaches itself to oxygen. Ammonia does the same thing, but it's a different ratio. Okay, so you have more oxygen on ammonia than you have you have than, than you have on nitrates. Okay. So it's magic. It's nature. That's what nature does. There's the algae there on the water. What's it doing? It's feeding the fish and it's converting nitrogen for the, for the, for the water. Okay. Good question. Any other questions on this whole thing? Because it's, it's quite difficult to understand, but the basis is vermicost or worm castings have a lot of bugs, a lot of things. Okay. They're not destroying one another. They're controlling one another. They are eating one another. Hmm. <laughs> so that's what they are destroying. So yeah. Once you eat something, you're destroying it. <laughs> okay. Okay, what they do is they, they all have their own function to do, okay? But if they get too much, 
then the, the, the scale is tilted, then it's wrong. So what they do, they keep each other in check. Okay? They keep each other in balance. So you have your, your good fungi and your bad fungi. Your good fungi eat your bad fungi. Okay? You have your good nematodes and your bad nematodes. Your good nematodes control your bad nematodes in the right environment. What has man done for years and years and years? Man's put on fertilizer. What is fertilizer? Okay. Now tell me about fertilizer. Fertilizer was discovered after the Second World War. How was it discovered? They had a lot of dynamite after the war that had blown up the Germans. Everyone was happy. They had these mounds of dynamite. They didn't know what to do with it. So they thought, ah, you know what? We'll just put it on the farmer's lands. They put it on the farmer's lands, and things grew like crazy. Hi, we've got some here. We've got fertilizer. What does fertilizer do? Fertilizer will give you a nutrient okay, will give you nitrogen, phosphate, or potassium, or microbes. That's what it does. But what does it do? It has a toxic effect on your soil. So all your, all your bugs that were happy and they were growing nicely, all of a sudden they're given poison. So they're gone. What happens today? Our soils are so bad that you have to add more and more and more fertilizer to get the same results. That's the problem. That's why we're doing this. Fertilizer destroys the bugs in the soil. You destroy your bugs in your soil, you've got an inkinga, a makulu inkinga. Things don't grow properly. Your soils become acidic, they become toxic, and the more you want to grow, the more you have to add. And the chemical fer the rep fertilizer reps love it. Because instead of putting on 5 kgs this year, you've got to put on 10 kgs this year to get the same result. And that's what's happening. That's a realization that mankind has come to you. Sure, he has a makulu in Kinga. He has a big problem. And the big problem is we've been putting just fertilizer. We've not been worrying about what's in the soil itself. We don't need to put fertilizer. Why? Because all our bugs, the algae, all that stuff, they make what's there available to the plant. That's what this stuff does. And that's not by me, that's from the scientists. Okay. Are we happy? Any more questions? Okay. Okay, so there we go. Worm castings is a soil enhancer. It improves your soil. It makes your soil better for plants to grow in. Okay? So in other words, if you take a baby and you feed it water, it's not going to grow. If you take a baby and you feed it mother's milk, it's going to grow. Why? Because it's getting the right stuff in. That's the difference. Fertilizer is just one thing. NPOK. And, and some, some micro-elements. That's all it does. It does nothing for your soil. It doesn't improve your soil at all. Your soil is where everything grows from. Okay. Are we happy on that? Of course, are you happy on that? Your head's down. <laughs> okay. So why does this stuff work? Because of those bugs we've spoken about now that you all started to think, what is going on here? Okay, that's just a background as to why this stuff works. Maningi. Okay, we'll touch on that just now. Okay, it must be well drained. So in other words, if I put water on, the water must be able to drain away. Otherwise, it becomes what we call stagnant. It becomes anaerobic, and the worms don't like that. The worms will, what will they do? Take their bags and they'll go. And I'll tell you a story about worms going. Okay? I went to go and see a farm up in Klagstorp, and this chap was a worm breeder. And he had a huge shed, and he had just cow manure all over the place, and lots of worms. And his neighbor, 
had a crop of cabbages that he couldn't sell. So he put the crop of cabbages 500 meters away from the shed. 500 meters away. That's half a kilometer he put the cabbages. This chap, one day he was there, not much to do, so he went over and he started looking look at the cabbages. And guess what? The worms were there. They'd gone half a kilometer. Half a kilometer, a little worm like that. Half a kilometer. A worm grows to three to four inches long. That thing can go. It travels. And it escapes from anywhere. You can do what you like. It will escape. It was not happy. Okay. So please have a well-drained area. We wear worm predators such as chickens, ants, okay? Why will ants come? If there's not enough moisture. Ants don't like water. And what does an ant do? An ant is there to clean up nature. That's what it does. So if it smells something's dying or something's dead, it'll go and it'll eat it. So to obviate ants, keep it wet. Rats, gundwans, we can put down all sorts of things. And birds such as hardy dars. Hardy dars love worms. Hardy dars have got long beaks like this. And you hear them go, ka -ka, ka -ka, and, they, and they'll take your worms. Okay? That's what they'll do. And not one, not two, thousands of hardy dars will come. So our growth rate of between 60 and 99 times in 12 weeks will disappear. Because the hardy dogs will eat them. They'll say, this is lacquer. And they'll make lots of babies and they'll eat lots of worms. So be careful. Okay, a level site is preferential. Not, not on a slope like that. Fairly level. Okay? And please note, this is very important, people. Newly laid concrete is toxic for worms. Newly laid concrete is toxic for worms. It's the calcium in the concrete that kills the worms. So if you're going to lay a strip of concrete and leave it for about between three and six months, then it's fine. But if you put worms straight on newly laid concrete, they'll die. That will kill them. They won't pack their bags, they'll die. They'll shonila. Okay, you don't want that. Okay. Probably about three to six months of newly laid concrete. Just let, let it get rid of all that stuff. You know, concrete, newly laid concrete, what's it like? It lets off a lot, of, a lot of gases and stuff. And the reason I know is because a friend of mine in, in, in Great Town, he, he's wizard worms, he had a customer that was doing well with worms, so they decided to make a new shed. They put the new shed the concrete down, they put the worms on, and they thought, hey, this is lacquer. Two days later, no worms. And it smelt dead worms. That's what happened. So I know. How do I know? Because of experience. Okay. All I'm telling you is from experience. I don't, I don't read it off Google. I don't, I don't look at Google. Okay. Okay. Covered or outdoor option. I like covered. Now, it can, covered can be just tin sheeting. It can be hail netting. It can be structure like this. It can be anything. Why do I like covered? Firstly, the worms are not affected by the weather as badly. Okay? So if it's outdoors and you have a frost, the worms get frosted. If it's indoors, they don't get frosted. Worms don't like to operate under 5 degrees centigrade. They go into hibernation. They go doo-doos. Okay. So bear that in mind. So if you're putting it outside, you're exposing it to the elements. They don't like to operate above 35 degrees. They die. Okay. So if it's outside and it's a very hot day, it will affect your worms. And what are we farming? We're farming worms. Why? Because we're going to sell them Kusanati worms, and we're going to make vermicost. So we can make money. 
So if you've got a simple, just a simple structure, it's perfect. Okay. Doesn't have to be fancy, just so long as they're covered. Secondly, the hardy dolls won't come. The hardy dolls are the biggest threat to worms outside. The hardy dolls are the biggest threat to worms outside. Indoors, you can also contr control your rats better and you can keep your cuckoos out. Okay. And thirdly, and most important, the moisture content, the manzi of the feedstock can be accurately monitored. Okay? Ask this man. The first time I went to their farm here in New Hanover, what did I say? Far too dry. There were red ants there. Far too dry. Okay. So water is vital, people. Water is vital. If you haven't got enough water, don't even start because you're wasting your time. Okay. It sounds simple, but believe me, that will have a huge bearing on the success of your... Right, ideal temperature conditions between 15 degrees and 25 degrees. That's what they like. Between 15 and 25, it's like they're lying on the beach, they're having a lack of time. What will they do then? They'll eat and they'll reproduce. What do you want them to do? We want them to eat and to reproduce. We want lots of inganis and we want them to chow. Okay, so they look like me. Above 35 degrees, they'll start to die off. Below five degrees, they will go into hibernation. Okay. So it's simple. It's nothing fancy. You don't have to have fancy equipment. You just know that indoors is far better than outdoors. Covered is far better than outdoors. Okay. Right. A red wriggler. What does it consume? It eats its own body mass every single day. Okay? So if you take a kilogram of worms, it will eat a kilogram of compost every single day. So people, you better have enough food for those animals. And they are animals. You better have enough food for them. And if you don't have food available, you can go and buy compost. You can go and buy compost somewhere. There are lots of people that produce compost. Go and buy compost. Compost, composted material sold by Guy Platt or sold by Gromo or whatever is better than nothing. If you don't have enough food, your worms are going to bagasha. Tata squam and they're gone. That's what they're going to do. And all that effort you've gone to is for lutu. Okay. They will vagasha. Beware. And... <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep them. <laughs> I put worms in a, you know those plastic little two liter containers with a lid. Okay? I put that in my motor car. Guess what? They all escaped overnight. Gone. Pillin and dugu. Gone. How they got out of there, I still don't know. But they went. They packed their goodies and they left. Pillin and dugu. I was so cross because I thought I'm very clever. Open it up. How? Oh, Lutu. Nothing. They're all gone. They escape. Why do they escape? Because they're hungry. Okay. Also, worms, they stay together like we do. You don't get one worm here and one worm there. They, get, they all stay together. Okay. You must bear that in mind as well. That's important. You probably look at the moisture, probably, if you wet it first properly, you look at the moisture once a week to make sure there's enough. You just keep on topping up all the time. You don't water every day three times a day, no. There's got to be enough moisture there for them. Once you, if you put in your stack and you put the water, it will stay there. It's not going to go anywhere. But you've you got to, when you put your stack in, make sure that there's enough water. And we'll see this afternoon. Okay. Same with feeding. So you said they make one kg of the worm feed, one kg of compost. Correct. So per day. Per day. Per day. So which means every day you must put that one kg. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay, we'll discuss that just now. Okay. All right, are we happy so far? Every day you go and look at your moisture. Every day you have a look, but you make sure that you, when you wet it first time, it's wet, wet, wet. And when I say wet, when you pick it up, pick up your compost, your field stock, and you squeeze it, the water's going to run out of your hands. That's 85% moisture. That's, so in other words, let's have a look here. Look at that. Look at that bottle, okay? This lady's drunk so much out of it. That's 85% moisture right there. That's how much water's got to go in that size. So it's a lot of water initially, a lot of water. And Manuel's right, if it's a hot day, just go and watch it. You don't necessarily have to put water, but just watch it. Okay, the only thing you have to do with these worms is watch the moisture and watch the food. That's all. There's nothing that kills the worms besides live con about, besides newly laid concrete. Okay, so it's... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. The manure. Correct. Make sure you've got enough manure. Okay. That is, that's a good idea. Any other questions on, on this whole thing? Because this is important. This is where the farm becomes a success or a failure. Is right here. Okay. Okay, that will eat its own body weight. So I will have to eat 102 kgs every single day if I was a worm. Okay? And what do the worms do? This is why they are amazing animals. What goes in, comes out. So a kilogram in is a kilogram out. A worm retains nothing. We eat a kilogram, out comes probably five grams. What goes in, comes out. Remember that. So if my kilogram of worms is eating a kilogram of compost a day, it's producing a kilogram of vermicast a day. That's important to know. Okay. They don't eat your trees. They eat the composted leaves. So everything has to be composted. Just bear that in mind. Very important. Okay. A combination of vegetable and livestock compost is preferable. So in other words, if you've got Cabbages that are composted and cow manure that are composted, that's 100%. That's what they like the best. That's what they like the best. A combination. So if you can have a combination, 100%. Now you're really on the right track. I can't. I don't have vegetable matter available. I don't think you can. You don't have vegetable matter available. But if you can, that is the ideal. And remember, a kilo in is a kilo out. Remember that. So nothing will go to waste. Okay, you must use what's available. Now you must decide as you sit here how much you have available for your worm. Because bear in mind a kilo for a kilo a day. That's what we're aiming at. It's probably a kilo We'll eat half a kilo a day, but we're aiming for a kilo to a kilo a day. So you've got to have enough compost. Enough compost, enough water. Okay. Are we all happy? Good. Okay. Using any new feedstock, please test the worms. I can't tell you what they want to eat. They all tell you what they want to eat. 
And how do you test them? You'll take a food stock, whatever it is. You take a handful of worms and you put them on top and watch them. If they don't go inside, they don't want it. How do I know that? Because I was very excited. I got some composted cow manure from somebody. Been there for a long time. I was so excited. I thought, this is going to be great. I formed a little bed. And I put them on top. They didn't, they didn't even go inside. I watched them wiggle on the top for half an hour. I was getting so cross. They wouldn't go inside. They didn't, didn't like it. Why didn't they like it? Because the salts were too high. They had a high, what they call EC value. They didn't want to go inside. I took them and I put them on my normal compost. They went inside straight away. I was so cross, but they taught me a lesson. If you're going to feed them, try them. If they go inside, they're happy. If they don't go inside, you can't use that stuff. So I can, send, uh, I can tell you what you can use till the cows come home. The worms will actually tell you what they want. Okay, the worms are clever. Okay, please understand that. Moisture, here we come to water. Between 65 and 85 percent moisture is needed for the worms to be happy. Okay, 85 percent people, 85 percent moisture in here. That's how much they want. Sure. The EC. Just put the rooms on top. If they don't go inside, don't, you can't use it. You can't. You can't. Yeah, it's, it's what they call salts. It's not salt. It's salts. Salts are or nutrients. Okay, so the salts content is high. The, the, e, the electric conductivity is high. That means there's a lot of salts. That means the electric current can go through the stuff. I tried everything. I tried everything. I tried everything. It doesn't, doesn't work. If they're not going to eat that, they're not going to eat it. That's it. Finish and claw. Throw it away. Lysha. Okay. Unfortunately, that's what worms are telling us. We don't listen to worms all the time. We want to improve. Worms are natural things. But in fact, they are the ones who are telling you. They tell me. <laughs> yeah. They are the ones who are telling you what to feed them. They say, hey, Keishla, you're wrong. I don't want that stuff. Okay, the case says, I won't go and see. What are you controlling them? Is they controlling you? Yeah. Oh. Well, what are they? What are worms? Worms are women and men together. Oh. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah.
that the best, the best instrument to test, the best instrument to test is the worm. The worm will tell you. Okay. So just bear that in mind. I can't give you any guarantees because I know. I know what worms are like. Okay. They're man and woman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, worm appearance. Okay, now we're going to look at the worms. Because what are we farming? We're farming worms. They're like the cormors. We look in the cormors every day. We want to see what the worms are like. Okay, the adult worm should have a strong color and appear in, to the appearance. Okay, so let me go right back. Let's go right back. Dooza, 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 dooza. There we go. There are worms. Look at the nice red color. Those are healthy worms. Okay. You will get worms that are pale, they've got no color, and they're small. You know what? You've got an inkinga. Okay, so let's get back to where we were. Which was, there we go. Okay. The adult worms must be, have a strong color. They must be red. They're known as red wrigglers. So what does that say? They're red and they wriggle. That's what they have to do. If they're pale and they wriggle, they're not happy. If they're pale and they don't wriggle, they're dead. Okay. We don't either. We want strong, healthy worms. And... There must be cocoons visible. If there are cocoons visible, remember what the cocoon looked like? If there are cocoons visible, that means they are breeding. If they're breeding, they're going to increase the number. If they're not breeding, you won't find cocoons. And a cocoon is a small thing. It's a small thing, which you'll see today. Hopefully they've got cocoons. I don't know. Okay. Worms that are small and pale in color are unhealthy. Why are they unhealthy? They don't get sick. Nothing kills a worm. They don't get diseases. The only two reasons are food stock and not enough water. That's it. Those are the only two reasons why they won't breed. Because they don't have the right food or enough food. They don't have enough water. Or the right water. That's it. That's all you have to worry about with worms. Nothing else. Simple. It's easy, people. It's easy peasy. Okay. Right. Identify problems early. Look. When you set your beds, look at your beds. Okay? Make sure the worms like the new feedstock. As Emmanuel said, if they're going on top, they don't want it. In Kinga, problem. You can try and take it away, you can recompose, you can do whatever, but that worm will never be efficient in that type of environment. You can recompost it, you can recompost it, you can recompost, but they're never going to be as efficient as if they go into it straight away. Okay. Observe where the worm is in the pile. Okay, if you've got a windrow, See who the worms are. Because the worms are like us. They like to move in clumps. They don't want to be on their own. Because, why? If you want to find somebody to have in Ghanis, you don't have to drive to Joburg to find the person. You want them right here. That's what worms are. They move together. Okay? They move together. They move in what we call colonies. And they move around, but they normally start feeding at the bottom, and they work their way to the top. They go down again, and they work their way to the top. They go down again, and they work their way to the top. So if you put worms in, and after a week or so, go and find where they are. If they're on the surface, there's an inkinga. There's a problem. They don't like what's down there, because they normally go down there. Okay. What's down there might be too much water. It might be food that they don't like. So if they're on, on the surface all the time, there's a problem. 
My stacks at home, they're big stacks. I don't even look at my worms because they're deep in the stack. They're deep inside. You'll never see them. And that's the thing with farming worms is the less you see them, the better. They're doing their work. If you see them too often, they're not doing their work. Okay. <laughs> if you put water and they've got food, they won't go anywhere. Okay. The less you see the worms, the better. It means the healthier they are. Okay. Bear that in mind. Make sure the food stock is wet enough. Again, I say, people, moisture is key. Moisture is key. So if you have a stack that's a cubic meter, that's a meter by a meter by a meter, you've got to put in 800 liters of water into that stack. Okay? That's what you have to do to make it wet enough. How do you determine the quality of worm castings? You can't. You can't. Somebody brought me two packets of worm castings. Little old packets. And they said, what's the better value? And I said, I've got no idea. You know why? Because you can't test the, the, the NPK. You can't test anything. It's the microbes that are in there. Okay? All you can see is if it's nice and if it's like, uh, like coffee, like a like coffee, okay? But wet coffee, very wet coffee, okay? That's what we call friable. And that there are no foreign bodies like stones and sticks and whatever in it. That's the only way you can determine the quality of your vermicost. You can send it away overseas for 20 grand, for example. They'll send you a report back. A list like this of microbes. What are you going to do with it? You don't know. You've got no idea what's in there. Man doesn't know what the soil needs. That's man's problem. He doesn't know what the soil needs. He thinks he's clever, but he's not. He's dwarf. Oh, well, yeah, you just send, you get a, a Sudara analysis. And you, see, and you send a sample and send that up to Pretoria. And they'll register it as a class 2 fertilizer. They don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. Okay. So it's difficult to, the quality is very, very difficult to, to ascertain. The only way you can ascertain it is by getting bigger crops. Then you know it works. Okay. But you will get bigger crops. How do I know? So they have done trials for me. I know I've seen it with my own eyes. Okay. Ways to harvest. Okay, now we've got our pile, we've got our worms, and our vermicost is now ready. Now what are we going to do? How? Because if we're doing vermicost, we want to keep the worms and sell the vermicost. If we, if we want to sell worms, we want to keep the vermicost and sell the worms. Okay. So how are we going to do it? I use a trommel method. Okay. That's a big, you know those sand separators, those big things that you turn with by hand with the sieves? That's called a trommel. It goes round and round and round and round. And the advantages to that and the disadvantages to that. Okay. The advantage is it's quick. The disadvantage is it kills the worms. Because you can imagine a poor little three-inch worm falls a meter. Eibo. It gets very sore. And when it lands, it has other stuff put on top of it. So the poor worm is very sore. That's a problem with the trauma. But it's efficient. It's quick. Okay? The vibrating sieves <laughs> that can sort it out is also a risk. Not a big, as big a risk, but there is a risk to damaging your worms. Okay? There's hand separation, the best method, but very slow. And there's, then there's the migration method. Ha! 
What do worms do if they're not happy? <laughs> That's what they do. Okay. So now, what I've been, I've been going on about moisture, water. So I've got this stack here by my good lady Mandy that's ready. And I've got a stack here that's new food. Okay. And it can be meters away. It doesn't have to be next door. So this now has got 80% moisture. This has got no moisture. Okay. So what do I do? I start drying this one out and I put the water in here. Okay. After a week, off they go. They move. That is the most effective way. But the one in Kinga is that the cocoons can't move because they haven't hatched yet. Oh, Nanko, okay. I like broadcast. Now, I'll tell you why I like broadcast. Because what are we doing? We're improving the soil. Not just where the plant grows, but everywhere. Okay? So, I'm plying here, and I'm plying there, this year. I apply to the root zone here, and I apply to the root zone there. Next year, I'm not going to apply in exactly the same place. I'm going to be a bit... And what, what are we applying? We've got nematodes. What do nematodes do? Nematodes are like taxis for bugs. They move. So, I put right across the field. So the whole field has bugs put in it. They move all over the place. They're alive. They're living. They grow. They grow in the soil. They improve the soil. They make the soil better. It's not a fertilizer. That's the difference. That's what I like. Okay? So if you broadcast it all over, your whole, all your soil will improve. And next year when you come to plant, You'll have a better quality soil. Better, your soil health will be far better than last year. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then we go to top dressing. Okay. Now you can apply vermicast any time. It doesn't matter whether it's at soil preparation, whether it's at planting, whether you top dress, whether it's after you've harvested, doesn't matter. Because you're not applying it to the plant, you're improving your soil. So if you've planted, you can take vermicost and you can put it on the plants. And that to me, and I'll tell you why, there was a chap up in Belgaon that was growing cannabis. And he phoned me and said, John, I want vermicost for cannabis. And I said, yeah, and he said, no, I need to plant. So I said, I don't have available at the moment. Anyway, when I had a phone him, I said, okay, can I bring it? He said, yeah, bring it, we'll, we'll see what we do. We top dressed. He had the best crop he's ever had. Because the microbes decide where they want to go in the soil. They have their own mind. They're clever things. They do their own thing. You don't have to put it in at planting time. You can put it in whenever you like. And then we have the final one, which is, Emmanuel loves this one, foliar spray. Okay. You see this stuff here? This stuff there. You put it on the leaves. Okay? How do you do that? You take a, a drum, you put water in, you put it, you put the vermicost in like a tea bag, so it's in a bag, you hang it in, or you put it in. You don't let it go, it doesn't go loose, it stays in its bag. Then you bubble it, you put, water, you put air through it. Bubble, 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 it bubbles fast. Okay? The bugs that we're dealing with are aerobic. They like air. So the more air we put into the water, the more they multiply. The more they multiply, the better we have. We then spray it on, onto the plants. Okay? And you get bigger leaves, stronger leaves, and less disease. That is a fantastic way of applying it. So it's as simple as that. 
called. You can put it on the foliar so you don't have to put it in the ground. You can put it on the leaves. Okay. So there are lots of ways of applying the stuff. And the video we'll see just now, you'll see why. You'll see what the results are from foliar application. The best is to do in the ground and on the leaves. That's the best. You'll get the best results. Now, I'll tell you how I know. There's a lady down in Harding, very clever lady. She's got the grease coming out of her ears. And she does the foliar spray thing on her cane. And her cane's production has increased by 40%. Not 20%, but 40%. Okay. She's been doing it for a long time, so her soils are healthy. Her cane is healthy. She hardly puts any fertilizer down now. 40%. Now, if you take 40% in anyone's language of any crop, it increases your income by 40%. Hey, hey, we're so happy. That's what it does, people. That's what we're talking about. That's the value of vermicost. And that is why Emmanuel and Nkosanati are getting increased sales all the time. Because suddenly people are realizing we don't have to buy expensive fertilizer. We've got something that's inexpensive and works best. Okay. Right, I'm done.